The book of Thessalonians is written to the Christians in a town called Thessaloniki. And uh, it's a really a book that one needs to read. It's short, not too long, but it's a kind of it has a kind of message that builds you on your on the basics, the basics of your Christian faith, and uh, covers not just the basic theologically, but the practical way of living the Christian the Christian life. And because it's um, it, it is so 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 clear, it's a kind of book you'd want every young young Christian to actually get to and read. Um, and I think that's that's a that's a that's a very very important thing. You know, around AD fifty one, Paul, Silas, and Timothy brought the message about Jesus the Messiah to this city of Thessalonica. And uh, it's, they have never had that message, but many of them soon trusted in the Lord, and that changed the the economics and sociology of the place. So some people are very, very hurt by this change of beliefs and the people joining this new group of people. So they ended up to be a riot where Paul and Silas were accused of defying Caesar's decrees for talking about Jesus, another king. We find that message in Acts chapter 17. They actually wanted to kill them. But uh, they narrowly escaped with their lives. And they left the town. Young believers, not fully established in God, but they have found Jesus, the new king. And they were lay, they have allegiance to him. And the little knowledge they had learned, they worship, continue to worship. But you know, not too long after, Paul wonders, how are my new believers in this fighting and persecution? How are they actually surviving? Might they actually backslide due to the to the persecution and opposition? That's why we learn in the book of First Thessalonians that he actually sent his son in the faith and fellow missionary mate called Timothy um, to encourage them. You know, basically he was half Greek and half half Jew. This Greek. So, most likely he was more acceptable in the Thessalonica than Paul, who was a Jew, could be. So he goes, so Timothy goes and visits them and is able to have a good time with them. So when he comes back to Achaia, where Paul, Paul is, he has wonderful, fantastic news that this new church left without proper preparation, was actually surviving and doing well. The Christian, the Thessalonian Christians were actually faithful to God. So this letter of Paul is actually writing to this young church to show his excitement for God who only could have made them survive being with them. It was a letter of joy. So we saw in this, in this, right from the first chapter, that Paul is recalling the time he was establishing the church, and in the process giving thanks. That from that kind of background and difficult background, they were continuing in faith. He is also recognizing that they have gone through a lot of trials and challenges, but have survived. So he now wants to establish them deeper in the things of God. So he covers various subjects. The letter now talks to them about avoiding sexual immorality, which of course may have been traditionally accepted in the culture of those people. But now that they are Christians, they cannot continue with the same, with the same, same kind of beliefs. They would have to, to change. Sexual immorality would have to change. Now it is one man, one wife, if you are not yet married, you don't have sex. And uh, you don't have sex with anybody other than the person you are married to. 
Anything else is sexual immorality, and a Christian cannot be involved in it, he tells them. They are also supposed to love one another. If you are Christian, there should be, there should be some, some love for each other, like a family. And, I think that, and so and that love must be with sincerity. He also deals with the subject of diligence, the importance of working, working hard so that you earn your daily bread rather than become a beggar. You can see there are very, very practical things that he wants to, to, to deal with. But then he also goes into a more complicated question. What's the Christian hope for those who have died? If you die, what happens? He wants them to understand that, because of course it must be a theologically interesting question, but past, a pastoral question, because they are losing people, what happens to them? So he takes the time in the letter to explain that the believers who die before the appearance of our Messiah, because Jesus is coming, but if you die before then, you are not lost, he tells them. Why? Because you will surely be resurrected from the dead. At the time the trumpet sounds, you will meet the Lord in the air. Therefore, there is hope even if you die. So he takes the time to remind these young believers that Jesus will appear suddenly and unexpectedly. What should we do about that then? We should live in such a way that you will not be ashamed to greet him at the time of arrival. That you will hear the trumpet and be happy to meet him because you have walked in righteousness and have walked in faith. So, what's the basic message of Paul in this letter? Keep up the good work. I'm happy with hearing that you are working with the Lord. Keep doing it. So it's not a criticism, it's not a challenging, it's not like Corinthians, and with all the issues that had happened in the church, here, the whole letter is positive, just building on the things the Lord had done for them. Looking at, um, at, at the sub, one of the subjects he deals with, on how to relate with one another, the, the, the message that covers that is seen in verse, verse 9. Now, about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you. For you yourself have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, you should Mind your own business and work with your own hands, just as we told you, so that you, your daily life will be, will, may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. How do you end up with a good church, with a good fellowship, with a good family, with a good clan? That's what he's dealing with, and he gives them very good advice. The first one is love one another. Love one another. There's no way you have teamwork and you have a, a fellowship, a good fellowship, if you do not love one another. Love one another. And I think that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, an important thing. What does it mean to love each other? You know, love is a very misused word. It means you think of other people's welfare, desire them to be in a better place than they are, desire to relieve them of any pain they have. That's what it means to love each other. So we are learning that if we are in the same church, like brothers and sisters, we must seek each other's welfare and be more interested in the welfare of the other person than you are on your own. That's what will create love. So we are learning, Paul is teaching them, that if you are going to be a good church, there must be love for one another. 
Now, the other thing I'm hearing is not love just for the gifted ones, for the ones who have more money. It's love for everybody. All you need to qualify to be experienced this love is to be born again, know Christ, and irrespective of how you dress, what you have and don't have, the other brethren will love you just as you are. You don't have to change for them to love you. They will love you exactly as you are. And I think that's, that is something very important for a team, whether it's a football team. People must respect each other and desire each other's goods. Why respect? If you don't respect people, you can hardly listen to them. Respect is what causes you to want to hear what the other person is saying. Therefore, your love will be consummated if there is respect for each other. But it's also not just that. It's a desire for the betterment of the other person. And if you are like that, you can imagine a church like that where everybody is looking after the back of every other person. And they are all looking at how to improve each other's welfare. What kind of a church would that be? I think it would be something that would really um, make the, the church cohesive. So he said, it's very odd. Now about you, your love for one another, we do not need to write to you. What does he mean? In other words, I hear the, the way Timothy found you, you are already loving each other. You are already caring for one another. You are already desiring each other as good. You are already showing respect for one another. Therefore, I don't even need to write to you. Let me ask you a question. You belong to many fellowships. Is there one of them where this, this, this admonition would not be useful because you are operating at a very high level, caring for one another? You know, caring for people who are difficult, caring for people who are very needy, but you, the, the, nobody thinks of throwing them out or ignoring them. They are all feeling like they are appreciated and cared for. Is that true of your team, of your fellowship? Really, that's a question you do. Because Paul is suggesting it's a very, very important issue. So we don't need to write to you. You are really doing well. For you, yourselves, have been taught by God to love each other. Two things in this. That this love for each other is not voluntary. It's something God requires. In fact, he's the one who has actually taught you. And I think that will be important to bring God in. That when you love others, you are pleasing to God. Because those are God's instructions. That's what God teaches. For you yourself have been taught of God to love each other. But the second thing we are learning is that um, loving is a teachable subject. That's not something automatic, you know, because you are born and you are loving. No. It means there is some teaching to happen. To teaching that people may know where they are needed, how they are needed, and how they can help in it. That will be something quite quite critical. Just look at the, the next the next verse, verse ten. And in fact, you do not love all God's family. Yeah, but in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yeah? In other words, it's not just a church at Oronica. These people love even others. And um, is that true? Or is your love tribalistic? You love people in your church, in your tribe? But you don't love people who are outside your tribe. You don't love people who are outside your church. You don't love people who are outside your home. You don't love people who are outside your profession. These ones were unlike that. They loved geographically. Everybody in Macedonia experienced the love and care of these people. And I think that will be something that we need to be aware of, that our love must not be like there is not enough of it. Therefore, you can't give this one love and this other, love, other person love. It will be important to show that since it's the love of God being exhibited in your, in your heart, and Jesus says, for well, God so loved the world that he gave. I think you should, be, you should not be seen as a person who has such scarcity of love that you can only love one or two people. These ones are loving people who are even 
outside the the immediate the immediate church just 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 go on and and see what he what he says he says yet we urge you brothers and sisters to do so more and more in other words i recognize that the first requirement of a good church which is loving each other is an ingredient you, you every church requires every team requires but you are doing well in it however don't have an arrival mentality. Why can't you improve it more and more? And I think that will be quite, quite, impo quite important to understand more and more, progressive, increasing. You need to have an incremental. So can you say you, your fellowship is better now than it was last month? It's better now than it was last, last uh, um, year or last 10 years or whatever? What would you say about your relationships? Are they improving? Are you doing more and more? So you need to keep setting your targets higher in your relationships. If you if you have a if you are able to relate with twenty percent of the church, can't you try to bring it to fifty and then to a hundred percent? If people if you are giving people a bit of time, can you Try to reorganize your time to give them more time. Now, do you, what are you doing that's inputting into other, other people so that they are better off socially, economically, and spiritually? That's really one of the things we will, we will need to establish and understand. But then verse 11 and 12 is um, a passage about living interdependent life. Remember, there are three types of people in a fellowship. There are people who are dependent. They're in the fellowship and they're happy to be idle and get help and support from everybody. They always give me, help me. Oh, I'm lacking this, I'm lacking this. They don't feel embarrassed about the begging spirit. In Christian groups, these things happen. And Paul wants to address it, to say you will not be a good team when you are a dependent. And that's not a good thing to be. Then he, the other thing he wants to establish is, a, is the other ex extreme of independent people. They don't care. They're in church, but they, 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 they say live and let live. They don't want to get bothered by what's happening to other people. They are independent minded. They don't want to get any help from others either. Neither will give, give help to anybody. So they are independent. And these are two different extremes. People who are dependent and uh, want to do certain things. And uh, I'm saying if you are dependent, you are really are not a Christian in the sense that Paul wants. Because to be dependent on human beings means you don't trust in God. If you trust in God, God can use human beings to meet your needs. But you are not depending on human beings. You are depending on God. And when you talk to God, God has called to people, and even without necessarily, sometimes without even asking them, they can offer to help, but not you begging. And I think that's, that, that, that's what Paul wants to, uh, to establish, that dependent is wrong. But independent is all wrong. To imagine that God has given you certain gifts, certain resources, just for yourself and yourself. No, 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 no. Part of it he has given you. That's why he's given you more than enough. So that part of it is actually going to help other people who are not necessarily your family. So living an independent life is not biblically right. You are supposed to plug in with a fellowship. And in the process, you need each other. So therefore, what is Paul recommending? Interdependence. Not independence. Not dependent, he is recommending interdependent. And what is interdependent? It is where I help you where I'm gifted, and you help me where you're gifted. Nobody is depending on the other. We're just symbiotic and helping each other in the process. Let me just read verse 11 and 12. It's one long sentence. And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, 
You should mind your own business. Work with your hands, just as he told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. If you look at the two verses, verse 11 and 12 together, you see the beginning says, make it your ambition. If you skip all the verses, all the phrases and go to the last one, not to be dependent on anybody. So make it your ambition, the message is, make it your ambition not to be dependent on anybody. That's not something preached very often, but Paul wanted the Thessalonians to know that, that they should have an ambition not to be dependent on others. The reason Paul calls it ambition is because that will be a desire, you'll work at it, but sometimes God doesn't allow you to be independent of others. He'll make you have a problem that others will help you in. But your ambition is not to be helped. Your ambition is to be not dependent on anybody else other than God. So if he had given it as a command, don't be dependent on anybody, that will not be, that will not be possible because many people... I will not qualify to go to heaven. But he is saying, do you have in your heart, do you enjoy being a beggar? Do you enjoy depending on others? If you don't enjoy, that means you only will get help when you must. You will not go begging or looking for it. And I think that's what I hear, hear Paul, Paul, Paul saying. That we need, we need to teach that. Independence, we need to teach uh, at the same time, when God chooses, decides to use others, you cannot say no to help. Um, but you should be uncomfortable depending on others. So make it your ambition not to be dependent on others is the theme and the desire of Paul for everyone. So how are you going to achieve that? The rest of, the, the rest of us, 11 and 12, actually tells you how to achieve that level of interdependence. Um, number one, there needs to be to be a motivation. What is the motivation of trying not to depend on others? Just look at the, the end. That your daily life may win the respect of outsiders. The real motivation why you don't want to be dependent, is so that it can be a witness. How you live your life can be a witness, even to non-Christians. So why are we going to live interdependent lives where nobody is a beggar of others? Because once, once you are a beggar, beggars seem to have no rights. Yeah, you, and if you are, bene, if, if, if you are the, 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 the benefactor, you get respect. Beneficiary, hardly get any respect. So it will be important to know one of the motivations why you don't want to be a beggar is because you want to set a good example. Paul says that elsewhere, where he refused to get past a salary, which he, had, which he deserved, work with his own mind, hands. And he said he, he is proud about it. He is happy with it. So I think it will be important for us to have that at the back of our mind, that... Uh, our ambition is to do whatever we can so that the non-Christians would respect God. And I think that will be, that will be important. So how are you going to achieve it? So the, you have the right motivation. Number two, you will lead a quiet life. What does a quiet life mean? Not interfering with other people's uh, peaceful coexistence. I think that will be important, you know. There are people who are called busy bodies. But here we are learning that what power, if you are really going to have a good, a good fellowship, you must make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Quiet life means a life of non-interference with other people's affairs. Whether those people are your parents or they are your children or they are your neighbors. When you live this is the kind of life that will help earn respect from outsiders and help you to be 
in a team to deal with the issues that are facing the group. I think it will be important to understand then that you have the right motivation. You are really want to. You really don't want to sp to spoil God's name by claiming to be a Christian and you're acting as a as a beggar. But in addition to that, we are saying leading a quiet life, choosing not to shout to people, to cry to people, to blame people, is what it means to lead a quiet a quiet life, not interfering with other people. That will be very important. But the other thing, the, the, the portion of scripture is saying um, that will help you to lead, to, 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 to meet your ambition, you should mind your own business. The first time I read it, I thought, hey, isn't that rude? You can you imagine telling somebody, mind your own business? But that's what the word of God is saying. That if you really, truly want to please God, it will be important that you actually behave the way Paul is Paul is putting it in clear, in very clear, very clear terms. You mind your own business. Why? Don't be a busy body minding other people's business. But maybe, maybe they're here. It's talking about, even as you relate with others, be conscious about your own failures and uh, that how, how vulnerable you yourself are. That will be minding your own business. Jesus will put it differently. He says, first of all, care about the speck, uh, the log in your own eye, so that in the process you can see the small speck in other people's eyes. I think it will be important that um, that comes, comes out that if you truly want to be a person who is honoring to God, it will be very, very critical, very, very critical that you mind your own business, mind your own business. But that means, number one, you must have the business. Number two, you must mind it. You know, some people are, are dependent on other people's sweat. Mind your own business means your needs are your needs, not your uncle's needs. Your weaknesses are your weaknesses, not your mother's weakness. Mind your own business means struggle with your own challenges and seek God's help in how to, res how to resolve them. Don't let your problem become a public problem. I think that will be, that will be important for you to, to understand. Mind your own business. Next, in trying to see how you can meet this... Uh, this uh, uh, ambition, not to be dependent on others. The passage goes on to say, and work with your hands. So, it will be very important. Elsewhere, he says it. If you don't work, don't eat. If you're really going to be a good part, part of the fellowship and encourage cohesive fellowship, it will be important that you eat your own sweat. Work with your own hands. I don't know why he, the Bible emphasizes with your own hands as if you can work with other people's hands. But what that means is that you actually are going to rely on your own sweat and uh, therefore not depend on others. So this is what discourages the idea of having fundraising for everything. Oh, so-and-so is sick, another fundraising. Oh, I'm having a birthday party, another fundraising. Oh, my child has gone to university, another fundraising. Mind your own business. So how do you sort yourself out? Work with your own hands. Is what Paul is teaching and teaching them. When you do that, then there will be you have good, good um, uh, report from outsiders and cohesiveness within the fellowship. And in the process. You, this behavior is going to win others to Christ. In the Bible elsewhere says, they shall know you are Christians by your love for one another. And what makes break, fellowship break is when people become dependent on each other and some people run away from the fellowship. That's why they are getting clear instructions and they are being told your ambition is not to be dependent on anybody. 
depend on God, not on another human being. The fact that you are both saved does not mean you depend on me. The fact that you are both saved does not mean I depend on you. I need to depend on God.